Now, the scientific rev rev uh, revolution, once again, we see that um, just like the Renaissance, this is happening amongst elites, these scientific elites. And for most women are not a part of this. And there's discrimination against women. Um, and so an example of that is, is Margaret Cavendish, who is a scientist um, and thinker. She's a, you know, sort of a, a philosopher on science. And she um, attempts to join the Royal Society of London, the Royal Society of London, this, this scientific society. And she is uh, prevented from doing that. Why do, how do women that are part of the scientific revolution have that opportunity to be a part of the scientific revolution? The answer is through family. The women that participate in science during the 16th and 17th centuries, this period of the scientific revolution, these women are the daughters of prominent scientists, the wives of prominent scientists, the sisters of prominent scientists, and that's how they have access to uh, scientific information and scientific tools to be able to become uh, you know, major um, contributors to the scientific revolution. So Margaret Cavendish is married to a major scientist. Um, and another example is Maria Winkelmann, uh, who is, uh, you know, uh, discovers many, um, many comets in Germany. Okay. German name there, Winkelmann. And um, she discovers many comets, comets along with her husband, who is an, a fellow astronomer. And so the examples we do have of women participating in science, um, it's usually because of that familial connection. Are most women who are married or related in some capacity to scientists allowed to participate in research science? No. Right, so the examples we have are exceptions to a sexist rule that women are, the general notion is that women are not participating in these scholarly activities. And that continues through the Enlightenment, right? Uh, Diderot compiles this encyclopedia which has thousands of articles written by hundreds of authors, none of which were women. And, um, of course, we have the example of Rousseau during the Enlightenment, who in his works argues that women are fundamentally different from men. And therefore, women have an ideal position. Their sphere is that of the home. They have a separate sphere, the domestic one. And so this will have a huge impact because this will confirm using natural law, right? Rousseau is looking at nature and sort of applying his observations of society and, make, you know, using this very reasoned um, discourse. And it will say that, you know, women should not be involved in politics. Women should not be involved in trade. But the ideal role of woman is in the household, raising children. And according to Rousseau, women have a unique nurturing quality that men just don't have. And when you think about Rousseau himself and how he abandoned his children uh, to orphanages, you can <laughs> maybe he's drawing upon personal experience. Now, we do see examples of women contributing to the Enlightenment as these hostesses of salons. And our great example is uh, the Madame Marie-Therese de Giafrin. And so it's a useful name to have in your pocket in, in, if you get a woman essay and you need to discuss women in this period around the Enlightenment because women host 
the prominent salons of Paris during the French Enlightenment of the 18th century. Um, Madame de uh, Marie Therese de Giafrin is the one of many, and she's uh, regarded as it's particularly important because she sort of creates this model. She has salons twice a week, once a week with artists, another once another time with with critics and, and writers, and she invites these prominent people and they attend. And she sets the tone, she leads the discussion, she has issues, she moves it, you know, she has topics that will be discussed. Her salons are highly regarded places to have a meal. She, in fact, moves the salon into, she moves the, the, the salon into the lunchtime, so it's a long lunch, and so that they can go in through the afternoon, instead of having these meetings at night. When people, you know, when people get tired, so um, she sort of helps create the mo the model of the salon. But there's other women too that could be, you know, you could mention and, and research, or perhaps your book mentions them. Um, and so, yes, women play an important role there. What else are women doing? They're championing the work of different philosophes. They're promoting it through their salons. There are examples of women that are helping to. Uh, move around the works of uh, blacklisted or banned writings, right? So they can uh, spread these things, even though these official censors um, are banning them. Uh, women who champion the causes of different writers to government officials and try to, uh, and for example, try to prevent those writers from being blacklisted. So there are. Examples of women definitely participating during the Enlightenment period, um, but in terms of actually contributing to the works that are being written and spread, it's very limited. Um, now, Mary Wollstonecraft is from she writes Vindication on the Rights of Women in the 1790s in Britain. So this is late late Enlightenment. Uh, because the French Revolution has already begun in France. And so she is writing uh, that basically all those rights that these male thinkers have said apply to men should also apply to women. Um, but the fact that she writes this shows that this is not a common idea. And the common idea of the Enlightenment is that women are separate and uh, have a different role. And the roles, of, the influence of Rousseau's notion of a separate sphere for women is huge in the 19th century. That cult of domesticity, that the ideal woman is not working but nurturing her children and, you know, being a, a good wife and raising the family. That is the cult of domesticity and we can trace it back somewhat to the ideas that Rousseau argues.